the question of whether he's a conservative or to what extent he's a conservative is a really, really complex one. I mean, to what extent was Reagan a conservative? I mean, he passed the largest tax increase in any state's history as governor. He you know, signed the most liberal abortion law in, in the country. People work within the context of the political situation they're given. Uh, you can't kind of order what kind of ideological interventions you can make out of a catalog. You note a lot of um, interesting figures that played a big role in the Nixon campaign that are certainly newsworthy um, today, two people in particular, Roger Ailes and um, Pat Buchanan. And everyone loves hearing about Roger Ailes. So yeah. the current CEO of Fox News. Tell, me, right. tell me the notable things that you learned about him while researching. Well, you like to use the N-word, that's one. Uh, but uh, he, uh, this, this, none of this is original to me, but there's a fascinating book called The Selling of the President. It's a classic. It came out in 1969. This young reporter named Joe McGinnis basically was able to worm his way to the confidence of Nixon's uh, advertising team, kind of by guile and, and, and ingenuousness, and he was able to kind of follow them around. Roger Ailes was the guy who invented the town meeting, the fake town meeting, right. where you have a group of people uh, right. asking the candidate questions, and hand selected by the campaign. The audience was hand selected by the campaign. The they general were, viewer thinks it's you know real. It's, it's all and up and up, right? And, and, and Roger Ailes figured out a way to cut these into little 30 second commercials to make it look like you know everyone was going gaga for Richard Nixon. And uh, you know, he, 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 him and his team uh, greatly increased the sophistication of, um, of the kind of heart-tugging, heart-rending, uh, scare-the-pants-off people, TV commercials that, that went on for Richard Nixon. And what was Pat Buchanan like? What was Pat Buchanan like? Not altogether different than he was now. Uh, he had a very important role in the White House. He actually was a kind of young man in the make. He was a conservative columnist for a paper called the St. Louis Globe Democrat. His specialty was writing, uh, uh, basically laundering um, intelligence, quote unquote, from, from J. Edgar Hoover that people like Martin Luther King were communists and things like that. So he was like this hard right kind of attack dog, kind of right wing hack, basically. And uh, he loved Richard Nixon. He was convinced that uh, this was a conservative force that he could back. He approached him in 1966 when Nixon was making his comeback and getting ready to run for president. Uh, became one of his most trusted advisors in those early years. In the White House, he had a very important role. He was the guy who prepared the president's news summary every day. So he, he basically decided which news articles Richard Nixon would see every morning with annotations about which ones were important. And uh, he also kind of was an armchair strategist. So he wrote, wrote these memos, um, in fact, um, uh, uh, George Packer quotes some, some of them in the New Yorker last month in his article about uh, conservatism and Nixon, uh, you know, saying basically, well, our goal should be to divide the country in two, and if we polarize the country in two, we can end up with the bigger half. Some really kind of hard-charging, kind of nasty memos. Uh, and uh, he actually became quite disenchanted with Richard Nixon because of just the reasons you said. Uh, he used the N-word. He said uh, basically that, uh, you know, uh, Nixon has made conservatives the N-word of the Nixon administration uh, in a memo. And so he was very uh, disillusioned with Nixon, although that hasn't kept him from you know, defending, defending him from, you know, like a lot of conservatives basically interpreted Watergate as this liberal witch hunt, you know. So uh, if the liberals were against it, we have to be for it. If the liberals were for it, we have to be against it. So people like Pat Buchanan go on TV and say, oh, well, you know, there was a war on, what, what was he going to do? And, you know, hippies were bombing buildings. And, Fascinating guy. A, lo a lot of he didn't return my calls though. He wouldn't. Why didn't he return your calls? He, he, what did he even he, say? No, Connie just wouldn't return at all. Just, uh, just uh, one time I got his wife on the phone and, and she said he'd call back and he never did. Well, I'm sure if he didn't, then I'm sure Roger Ailes never called you back. Or you didn't even try. I didn't even try. Rod Roger Ailes, his his he's famous for his um, his uh, studio at Fox has a bomb-proof walls. That's how kind of paranoid he is. Yeah. So. One, very critically with the book, a lot of people are reviewing it very well, but one issue they have in it is that your argument that Nixon, in many respects, is responsible for the partisan chaos that we have now. Can you elaborate on your Well, I would say we have partisan chaos now, but uh, he is certainly responsible for um, the general shape and style of Republican campaigning now. I mean, when John McCain says he's the American the American president for Americans, you know, or John McCain, you know, puts on a TV commercial in which he shows uh, the cavorting bodies at Woodstock 
and says that Hillary Clinton, you know, uh, appropriated a million dollars for a Woodstock memorial. And by the way, I was busy being a prisoner of war at the time. Those themes of sort of there's a sturdy, upright uh, America that goes to work every day, works hard, plays by the rules, and then there's these other scary people. Uh, that basically is a, a, a Nixon entailment. He uh, invented the idea that liberals and Democrats were the true snobs in society, which is a very important part of Republican electioneering that we saw, you know, used um, both by Hillary Clinton and the Republicans against our neighbor Barack Obama this year. Uh, that all comes out of the Nixon playbook, and uh, these things were not inevitable. You know, it's, 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 when Richard Nixon ran for president in 1960, that's not how he ran. He ran as basically a moderate, as a statesman, uh, as a guy who said that he could do the same things Democrats could do, only more efficiently. You know, he didn't, uh, he didn't red bait in that campaign, he didn't hippie bait in that campaign, but that was basically something he evolved out of his own sort of native character um, from his upbringing and adapted to the conditions in the 60s when people uh, were really kind of afraid, uh, reasonably so, of all the social changes that were going on. And he adapted his message to speak to people who felt like the liberal elites weren't answering their concerns about their fears of social change and social chaos. Since you're arguing that it was unique to Nixon that started with him, how did Eisenhower Get elected in '52. Didn't didn't Republicans try to paint Adlai Stevenson as some? Not really. Nixon did. <laughs> I mean, when, when Nixon gave speeches, he, he he you know he did what they call red baiting. Then he would say that uh, Adlai Stevenson is part of the college of cowardly college of, of communist containment, or he would say that Dean Acheson, who was the Democrats' uh, basically foreign policy sage, had pink eye. You know, but Eisenhower, no. I mean, his campaign was basically, I'm a general. I defeated Hitler. You know, uh, I'm going to go to Korea and solve the Korean War. Uh, I'm not going to um, make any big changes in uh, the basic New Deal social order. And the idea that uh, Eisenhower would go around, uh, you know, accusing um, certain kinds of Americans of being suspect Americans, uh, that wasn't his style. You don't think that he was implicitly told Nixon that you should do you know, oh yeah. Don't associate they had, with they it. Had a good that. So the, yeah. I mean, but uh, but that certainly wasn't um, well. You know, the, the politics. Uh, John Ehrlichman, Nixon's uh, political aide, said politics is the art of division. It's the art of polarization. In a sense, that's a truism. Every politician polarizes. They draw division between themselves and and the opponent. But the precise shape precise rhetorical contours of how politicians divide now really comes from Nixon's rhetoric, Nixon's way of looking at the world. Um, you know, it wasn't like uh, politics was all hearts and flowers in the 1950s. You know, in fact, some of the, some of the, um, and another thing is the partisan alignments were very different because both, both parties pretty much had equal numbers of liberals and conservatives back then. You know, so you had a lot of very conservative Democrats in 1950s say, Someone like uh, 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 George Smathers uh, saying that his um, his opponent was a, a, a sexagenarian. You know, I mean, so you know those kind of slash and burn political styles. Uh, you know, they were all over the place. But the the idea that um, the idea that uh, liberals were not like you and me, you know, was something that Nixon refined to a very high art, and uh, with the with the kind of um, forcefulness that you didn't really see before Richard Nixon came along. So shifting to the 2008 election, I know you write a blog, but you're also an historian. What should, should readers out there be pretty wary when they're reading op-eds that try to cite some 1992 or 1988 election example to oh, they further should be. that, that yeah. journalist's point? But, but they use it all the time, and it seems to be an effective argument whether they want to compare yeah, it to Yeah, well, I mean, my wife's a social scientist, and she points to what, what they call the small land problem. <laughs> You know, that if you look at post-war, you know, um, presidential elections, which are really the only ones that bear any kind of real resemblance to the political world we live in now, you know, there the only have been, you know, six or seven or whatever. And, uh, you know, how much statistically valid inferences can you draw from, you know, an end of six or seven, right? And, um, you know, you, you can basically do this parlor game where you can say, oh, well, this candidate is like this guy in 1988. But then you can also say this, this, this guy was uh, this guy was the other candidate.